He is currently an honorary research associate of the geology department of Rhodes University in Grahamstown. But he's had a really varied career. He was founder director of Kalahari Key Minerals Exploration, a private Botswana registered mineral exploration company. He's also been vice president for Exploration Diamonds of African Queen Mines Limited um, and responsible for the design and management of the company's diamond exploration programs in Botswana and Namibia and technical support for the company's gold projects in Kenya and Ghana. Prior to joining African Queen Mines, he was with Pan-African Mining with responsibility for the design and management of diamond exploration programs in Madagascar, Botswana and Namibia. He's also acted as an independent geological consultant, working for amongst others, De Beers, Rio Tinto and Trans Hex Group, focused primarily on the interpretation of kimberlitic indicator, mineral anomalies of the Kalahari environment. He's been key in forming Somabula Explorations, a privately held diamond exploration company working in Zimbabwe, and Ampel, a Botswana registered diamond exploration company. And Andy's going to be talking to us about the evidence that ancestral lions were wetland specialists. So with that, Andy, I'm going to hand over to you. Right. Thanks, Darlene. And I, I guess I must start just by thanking Tacoma Strategies um, for sponsoring this talk. And also a big thanks to the people I've worked with who've been immensely uh, supportive of the project. Um, just to very briefly give their backgrounds, Agustina Antunes is a, a, a geneticist at uh, Porto University in, in um, Portugal. Stephen O'Brien is also a geneticist. He's got two caps. Uh, one is at the Oceanographic Center, Novo Southeastern University in Florida in the States. And then also at the Institute, the uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky Institute for Genome Bioinformatics at St. Petersburg State University in Russia. It's actually an institute that he was responsible for initiating. Uh, Christian and Hunley are biologists who got their PhDs from the University of Pretoria based on their studies of predators in the Okavango Delta. And uh, Fenton Cottrell, who's known to his mates as Woody, is from Zimbabwe. He's got a PhD from Stellenbosch University, and uh, he's got many hats. He's a biologist, a naturalist, and also a geneticist. So um, uh, many thanks to all of those people. Uh, much of this talk is based on uh, my um, interactions with Woody and uh, he introduced me to the um, absolutely fascinating interface between biology and geomorphology, geology. And this talk is going to be very much based on um, concepts that uh, I picked up on, on the way from Woody. Uh, no, why don't we, for some reason we're not, oh, there we go. Um, this illustrates the uh, drainage system in South Central Africa in the early to mid uh, Pleistocene and there are a number of remarkable features. Firstly, the blue of various wetlands, there's a mosaic of them, and Woody coined the phrase of a, an archipelago of wetlands in South Central Africa in time and, which varied in time and space. Uh, sorry, where is my pointer? There we go. Uh, on the upper Zambezi, there was a, a major lake, um, which Woody dubbed Paleo Lake Belotsi. Uh, there's one called Paleo Lake Patrick on the Kafui River, and then a major uh, wetland covering what's now the Mkhadi Khadi swamps in northern Botswana. And one of the other features of this area is that there, there, there's some major river changes. And this is the Chambishi River in, in northern Zambia flows to the southwest and then abruptly 
turns to the north to become the Luapula. Uh, Livingston actually found the Luapula on his last journey and the holy grail of the explorers in those days was looking for the source of the Nile and he believed that the Luapula was it, a um, major north flowing river. Um, the Kafui River also flows to the southwest and then it does a major dog leg to the east. And these dog legs are typical of river diversions and this suggests that there's originally a, oh, I know what the problem is, and in. Oh, amazing what happens when, when you're plugged in. And uh, these dog legs tell us that the Chambishi was originally connected to the Kafui and they flowed into the uh, Mukhadi Khadi. And in the early Pleistocene, the drainage would have looked like this. The Chambishi Kafui would have been a major river system that sustained the Mukhadi Khadi at its uh, high level at about a thousand meters. And at that stage, it, um, it was about two and a half times the size of modern Lake Victoria, massive body of water, and it would have almost certainly modified the, the, the local climate in South Central Africa. And one of Woody's many interests, just to, to give some sort of background on this interface between biology and geomorphology, is that um, he looked at uh, lettery genetics as part of his, well, as his PhD. And uh, there are three distinct genetic varieties. There's the black lechwe, which you get uh, associated with the Banguela swamp. The kafui lechwe, he lives on what's known now as the kafui flats, which is the relict of old Paleolake Patrick. And then the red lechwe, which uh, many of you may have seen in the Okavango Delta. And uh, Woody uh, wanted to explain this genetic variation. One of the things about um, lechwe is that they're very habitat specific. They, they use wetlands as an ex escape from predators. So they very seldom uh, move very far from water. And Woody came up with what I've always thought is a wonderfully simple and elegant model that the ancestral lechery population would have been able to move up and down this, you, you'd have had a homogeneous population that could move up and down this Chambishi Kafui river system. And then once it became dismembered, you got isolated populations around Banguela on the Kafui flats and in the Okavango. And because of the isolation, they, they speciated independently. And um, so a wonderful example of how you need to know your geomorphology and Woody, uh, Woody's made geomorphology one of his big interests in life to, to understand biodiversity and species evolution. Uh, this talk's not on lechery, it's, it's on um, lions uh, as advertised. This just shows that African lions are broadly divided into two populations, West and Northern Africa. Uh, this is genetically divided and these differ from those in East and Southern Africa. So we're going to be talking about the lions to the uh, East of this dividing line. And this shows the genetic structure of these African lions. This is based on a paper by, uh, which included four of my co-authors, Agostino, Agostino and Toon, Steve O'Brien and Hanley and Christian. And they did a genetic study of lions and this shows the results of their analysis of mitochondrial DNA or, or one of the mitochondrial genes. Now, a mitochondrial gene, which I, I suspect you all know, is one that gets passed down the female line. Uh, sorry, no, no pun intended there. But um, 
so what that means is that um, male and female offspring will both inherit the the mother's um, mitochondrial DNA, but only the daughter will pass that on to the next generation. Now, genes, as probably everyone knows, can undergo spontaneous mutations. And when you get a new mutation, the term for this is a haplotype. And the colors show the distribution of different haplotypes in, um, in Eastern and Southern Africa. So these are different haplotypes of one mitochondrial gene. The little box up in the corner here shows the relative proportions of each haplotype. So the most common one is, is the red one, uh, which is given the designation H11. That, the name's not important. Uh, then there's, there's this H1 haplotype that you get uh, associated with the Atosha lines, or it's the signature of the Atosha lines and um, the Okavango lines. What this box also shows is the ticks indicate the number of mutations separating each haplotype. And um, this uh, blue haplotype, H2, is, is not very distantly separated from the, the green haplotype, the H1. Uh, these are the lines in the Mpumalanga area, uh, Timbavati. So, uh, although it's a different haplotype, it's not very distantly separated from these ones in Itosha and, and the Okavango. Now, if you have two populations such as these with completely, that's not red, that's an orange, by the way, so it's a different haplotype. Um, these two populations don't share any haplotypes, but were they to interbreed, the mixed population should have uh, all of the haplotypes that you get in the two populations. So it should have a mixture of the green and the red. And the fact that you don't get this means that uh, these lines are from the southwestern Kalahari in the Transfrontier Park, um, the old Chemsburg Park, um, say in the Kalahari. Um, what this is telling us is the, the very counterintuitive um, observation that these line populations don't interbreed despite being in fairly close proximity. What was even more surprising is that in this original study by Agostino and his co-workers, they realized that the lines of the southwest Kalahari must have migrated to the northwest and populated East Africa which explains why the, the haplotypes in East Africa, apart from those in U Uganda, but most of them, uh, they share the same haplotype as the Southwest Kalahari uh, haplotype. And this migration probably took place fairly recently, probably after the last glacial maximum. Uh, glacial episodes are, are cold in uh, uh, everywhere and during European glacial episodes Africa tends to be very dry and um, then following the the um, the glacial episode the the climate warms the rainfall increases and the result is the grasslands uh, spread and with the grasslands you get the browsers and the grazer, grazers so it seems as though this migration, probably following the last glacial maximum, took place um, as a result of the expansion of favorable habitats um, as the ice age waned. Uh, waned. Now, not only did they study uh, line genetics, but the, uh, most of these line populations have a form of AIDS, which is referred to as feline AIDS or FIV. And um, the Okavango has a particular strain of, of FIV. And you pick up this strain in East Africa. And in contrast, the 
Southwest Kalahari lions are, are FIV free. So this suggests that they picked up a strain of, of feline AIDS uh, as they went um, probably through the Okavango area, but they didn't leave their genes behind. So they didn't interbreed with these lions. Uh, if they had interbred with them, presumably they would have picked up the H1 haplotype, the, the, the green one, and carried them uh, along with them as they, as they migrated into East Africa. So a, a very counterintuitive set of results, uh, however you want to interpret them, interpret them, but what they're definitely saying is the Southwest Kalahari lines and the Okavango lines seem to have something against interbreeding. Uh, I'd, I'd, in, in, this, this really was a, it was a puzzle for me when I heard about it. Uh, just to go back a bit, um, in, in the Eastern Transvaal, you of course get some of the, the white lines. It's famous for producing them occasionally, but more often these days as a result of interbreeding, del deliberate interbreeding. Now, just in case um, you have any concerns with the original data, this is a, 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 an independent study of mitochondrial genes from, from lines, obviously, and, but it used a very diff, uh, a different mitochondrial gene called site B, and uh, they, they identified a number of haplotypes. This is the Okavango area and Itosha. They share the same haplotype, so this duplicates that result. Uh, you also get some of this haplotype in the Pumalanga, the Eastern Southern Africa population. The Kalahari lines are separate haplotype, and you also see that haplotype in, uh, in East Africa. So, and, and in, uh, um, you, you, you've got mixed haplotypes in the East of South Africa. But basically, this completely ind independent study uh, using a completely different mitochondrial gene came up with broadly the same results. Just to show you what the lines look like, uh, these are some lionesses in the Okavango. Uh, they've just been eating a zebra. This is a, a young male lion who, it, it, this was summer and it was quite hot and he'd gone into the water to uh, cool down. And I've, I've spoken to friends in northern Botswana who uh, there are many very knowledgeable uh, uh, naturalists in, in, in northern Botswana. And the general consensus is that there's no obvious physical difference between the Okavango lines and the Kalahari line, despite the fact that they don't seem to like each other. Um, so, but anyway, this is a group of, of Okavango lines. Uh, another uh, little group. Uh, one of the features of these lines is that they're not averse to water. They'll, they, they have to cross channels as, as part of their normal routine. Uh, lioness with two cubs swimming across a channel, uh, swimming from a very young age. And these are the Kalahari lines. Um, another one, uh, this lad got tangled up with a porcupine. But uh, uh, these are basically pretty pictures. The, the information that people who are, I think are very authoritative is that you really can't tell these lines apart in physical condition, uh, physical characteristics. So this asks the question, are, are there other species where you also get a lack of interbreeding? And the answer seems to be yes. This was a, a, a genetic study of um, giraffe across Africa, and we just concentrate on these two populations. One's the, the, the Rothschild's giraffe. These are the pelage markings and the reticulated giraffe, uh, which has very different markings. And genetically, that lineage and that lineage are very distinct. 
uh, the, the genetics are saying that despite the fact that these two populations are living in very close proximity, there no obvious physical barriers, they don't interbreed. And we don't actually know why this is. Uh, it's, it's probably linked in some way to isolation during one or other of the, of, of the Pleistocene glaciations. Uh, this may have resulted in, this is speculative uh, by the authors of the paper that they suggest maybe there were changes in reproductive timing when the females came into est estrus, or possibly there was some pelage imprinting, uh, you only mated with similar looking um, giraffe. But th these are speculative suggestions what they do suggest is that there's been a long history of reproductive isolation. And of course, some people would then raise the question, do giraffe represent more than one species? Not something we're going to get into. So the lions don't look any different. Uh, let's just have a look at the different habitats where we get them. And this is just a, a, a detailed map of the area. These are the lines of the southwestern Kalahari, the Okavango Delta, and, um, and Itosha. And this is perhaps a, a Kalahari scene that people don't expect, but th this is the Kalahari in summer. The, it's, it actually would almost make an Irishman's eyes um, produce tears, uh, lovely and green. Uh, the rainfall in this area would have been about 400 millimetres. For those of you who know him, that's a young Leon Daniels taking a reading uh, on, on a cross-country travis. But in wintertime, the Kalahari is a very uh, different environment. Uh, uh, no rain, no surface water in, in the Kalahari. And um, it's a time of great stress to the animals. And... Um, as a result, a lot of animals have developed um, either physiological or, or behavioral um, traits in order to survive there. Uh, for example, um, the uh, Hemsbok will go digging around in the sand to try and unearth roots and they'll chew on the roots to get water. So uh, a very demand, uh, although the summers are wet, the winters are dry, very harsh, and a very demanding environment for survival. This is the Okavango in flood. The, the flood walk, waters come from uh, southern Angola and uh, take some time for the waters to get into Botswana. So the result is that uh, the Okavango floods during the winter months. In, in the, the flood generally arrives in June, July. So this is actually one of the residuals of Woody's archipelago of, or one of the extant residuals of Woody's uh, archipelago of wetlands. Uh, linked to one, this is Lake Ngami down here. This had water in it when Livingston came through in the 1850s. Uh, during, since then, it's dried out a number of times. About 15 years ago, it suddenly filled up again and it's, it's now bone dry. But these are wetlands in the dry summer month, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, the dry winter months when the surrounding Kalahari is a very arid place to try and survive in. And uh, I, I perhaps didn't mention it, but Woody emphasized the importance of these wetlands, uh, both in terms of biodiversity and in, in terms of understanding evolutionary processes. This is just another picture of the flood coming down in the Okavango and the surround, uh, surrounding area looking quite green in this picture but uh, um, would be an arid landscape. This is Itosha, also uh, probably one's picture of Itosha is, is a pretty arid savanna place but in fact um, Itosha is linked to a, 
a network of ephemeral drainage lines known as the cuvillae. And uh, during floods, the uh, Cunini fl uh, um, overflows its banks and floods the cuvillae. And if the flood is high enough, it can actually periodically inundate Lake Itosha. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the, the um, cycle, but it's every five or six years. But the important thing is Itosha and the Cuvillet represent another wetland, so uh, another of the extant uh, wetlands of this, this uh, archipelago of wetlands that Woody has, has coined. Just a Google image showing the, the Cuvillet and Itosha, and that's the Cuvillet uh, seen on the ground. And the, the, the Cuvillet floods a bit earlier than the Okavanga, but also um, late uh, autumn and early, uh, early winter. So it's flooding uh, when, when there's no rain and the surrounding areas are arid. So basically, the Okavanga and the Cuvillet Tosha are residuals of, of um, this more, originally more extensive archipelago of wetlands and they're wetlands within an arid surrounding savanna environment. So what we proposed was that the Okavango and Itosha lines have a preference for, for wetland and dryland areas respectively and um, in other words, the Okavango lines have, have adapted to wetland environment and the Atosha lines have adapted to um, an arid savanna environment. And for some reason, this adaptation, as with the uh, giraffe, we don't really understand what, uh, what separates them. Physically, they look very similar, but they seem to have distinct habitat preferences. And this um, idea, which some people thought was a little bit controversial, uh, has actually recently been supported by a new study of lion genetics in northern Botswana, where they studied lions in a, in, on a much more uh, detailed grid. And they studied lions in the Okavango wetland. Uh, this is the central Kalari game reserve and the Mkhadi Khadi. So, lions in savanna environments and also wetland environments. And what they found is that when they looked at the genetics, they had two populations of lion. The, the, the yellow shows lions that had a, a preference for wetland areas, or, or at least the majority of them were found in wetland areas. And the red ones, as in, so as in that, population. Uh, the red ones tended to have a majority of, of lions with a distinctly different um, um, haplotype assemblage. Uh, it's not a complete breakdown and part of the reasons for this is, is that um, there's not a complete separation of habitats. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in, in the Mkhadi Khadi, for example, uh, when the flood comes down, it, it may overflow down the Bateti River. So you may have a wetland following the Bateti River. And similarly, in the Okavango, this is actually a mosaic of wetland and, and savanna environments. But um, the conclusion from this study was actually that lions do indeed show a habitat uh, preference. So this raises the question, are there other examples of species that um, show these wetland and savanna habitat preferences? And the answer is very much yes. Uh, this is the white-browed scrub robin. It comes in two forms. The one with the streaks on the chest is very common in the, um, uh, in the Kalahari. And this one who lacks, the, the, he, he or, and she, by the way, they, um, uh, lacks the streaks and 
you, you find these in, in North, they widespread, but in Northern Botswana, they very much associated with the, uh, the wetland in, in the Okavango. So subspecies or races, as you want to uh, describe them, but uh, with distinctive habitat preferences. And why is this stuck? Sorry, I seem to have a stuck screen for some reason or other. Ah, here we go. Uh, this is another example. This is the swamp boo-boo, very much con confined to the Okavango wetland. And um, this is a close relative, the tropical boo-boo. Uh, in the field, you distinguish it by the, the buff uh, markings on the flank. And if you look at your bird guides, he's shown as not occurring in the Okavango. Although recently, um, we started seeing these swamp boo-boos in the Okavango, and interestingly, often sorry, the, these tropical boo-boos in the Okavango and often in association with uh, the swamp boo-boo, which suggests that um, there might be some sort of change taking place, but it almost, so many people saw them associated, it suggests that they might actually now be interbreeding. But previously they would have been regarded as wetland and, and savannah specialists. Uh, this has got nothing to do with the story, but he's just probably the most stunning bird in Africa, but another Kalahari specialist. And then of course the kudu, everyone knows, um, very much a savanna animal, and the same genus is, is a Setatunga, he's a wetland specialist. The next question, which possibly is getting into shaky grounds, but is when did you get a divergence of wetland and savanna populations. Now, from the original study that Agostino and Tunes and his co-workers made, which we, we've based our story on, the, the wetland lineage diverged at around about 269,000 years, and the savanna lineage diverged slightly later at, at about 100,000 years. There's quite a big error in this, but if we take these two dates as being roughly when it happened, these form within a period known as MIS-6 or Marine Isotope Stage 6. And this was a, a major glaciation. Uh, it's based, this is based on um, oxygen isotopes. If you going in this direction, the isotopes are saying that um, it's very cold, this is getting warmer, and this marine isotope 6 st uh, extended from roughly about uh, 200,000 uh, years to about 100,000 years. And they picked this up in core in, uh, that was drilled in Lake Malawi, and the, the analysis of the core suggested that this uh, MI6 glaciation was probably one of the harshest in Southern Africa, not necessarily elsewhere, but certainly in Southern Africa. So the, um, the wetland lineage seems to have diverged sometime early on in MI, uh, uh, MI6. And one explanation for that is that um, the, uh, the harsh environments during these glaciations, Africa would have been very dry. And under these conditions that uh, you had a, a major population decline and you were left with a very small uh, genetic gene pool that presumably managed to, to survive in um, one or two favorable wetland areas. And then at about 100,000 years, which is the start of the, um, the savanna lineage, uh, this is when the climate was warming up again. And um, sorry, we, we over here in MR6, I beg your pardon. Um, uh, with the warming up of the climate, you'd have had 
increased rainfall, expansion of the, the, the grasslands, uh, expansion of prey species, antelope. And um, we suggest that a population of lions that had somehow managed to hang in in the, in, in the uh, savanna environment suddenly found that they were now living in conditions very much to their liking and they actually became the, the dominant spray, uh, 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 pre, um, predator species. So what we suggest in effect is that the original lions were wetland specialists. They nearly went extinct as a result of this genetic bottleneck, managed to hang on, but another group that perhaps survived and adapted to savanna env in environment suddenly found that um, they were the most successful show in town. And we, we were busy uh, writing our first um, draft of, of, of our story when uh, Roy Miller uh, found some fossils in, in the Tosha Pan. And this included uh, a fossil which they interpreted to be a, a fossil lion, uh, which they called Panthera Lycleo. It, it looked, the, the, the fossil bones looked um, very similar to extant lion fossil bones. It was dated fairly reliably at 5 million, which would have made it the oldest known lion fossil. But what was really um, um, the uh, case, uh, the icing on the top of the cake, these were the associated fossils, fish, turtles, freshwater gastropods and flamingos, uh, basically a wetland associate, association. So we thought uh, that this really settles the story. Um, uh, ancestral lions were wetland specialists and uh, the savanna lions uh, and, and presumably very much adapted to this widespread archipelago of wetlands and that um, the savanna lions emerged from the, the basal wetland lions. And we hadn't quite got around to buying Roy Miller the, the, the beer that he deserved for this when uh, the geneticists um, who reviewed the paper told us that actually the, um, the Tosha lion fossil can't exist. Now, you can actually use genetics as a genetic clock to show the interrelationships of lineages and to show when, uh, when lineages started. The gray lines and the black lines show two different interpretations of the lineages of the pantherines. These are the, the big cats, the lion, leopard, jaguar, tiger, and snow leopard. To, to develop a, gene a, a, a genetic clock to try and measure these, uh, the timing of events, you, you need to calibrate it against um, fossil evidence. And at, at one stage, the oldest fossil known was at a, a, about 3.8 million years, but younger than the Tosha fossil. But there was quest a question mark as to whether it actually was a lion fossil. And the authors of this paper pointed out that, uh, in their view, this was unlikely. And if you use the next oldest fossil, which is about 1.8 million years old, to, to calibrate your, your clock, you, you got a much younger clock, suggesting that the pantherines only emerged at about 2 million years, and that the lions, that's this lineage, only emerged um, earlier than 2 million years. And they said, well, actually, um, your Itosha lion fossil is impossible. Um, so, Roy probably suddenly started feeling thirsty as his beer receded into the background. And sometime after that, they found a new pantherine fossil. This is um, uh, obviously a predator. Look at the incisors. 
this was named Panthera blathii, which was dated at late Miocene to early Pliocene, about 4 million years. It was found in the Himalayas and, and actually provides evidence that the, 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 this is the earliest pantherine fossil and it suggests that the pantherines may have um, developed in Asia or probably did develop in Asia. Now, with um, Panthera blathii, which is uh, we're, we're here, it is over here. With this fossil, you could now use this to recalibrate the genetic clocks. And this was the tree that they developed. And it showed the pantherines. These are all of this group up here. Um, that's Leo, that's the leopard um, and the tiger. Um, it, it, this new calibration showed that the pantherines evolved at about um, 11 million years. And here's Panthera Leo, and it suggests that he um, split off in, in the Pliocene at about 4 million years. So that fits in really nicely with the five million year old date for the um, uh, uh, for the Tosha fossil, and we we once again felt we should perhaps start thinking of buying royal beer for this. But uh, then we got another uh, um, review, and the reviewer looked at the picture of the Tosha line fossil, and he said, "Well, this actually isn't a panthera." It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a cat, but it's actually something known as Dinophilus, uh, linked to the saber-toothed uh, tiger, and, and, and um, this is known as the false saber-toothed lion. Um, but he has got nothing to do with, um, with Panthera leo, or at least a very distant relative. And uh, so therefore the, uh, the Tosha, uh, line fossil doesn't uh, exist. It's not a line fossil. It's a dinophilus, uh, which probably, by the way, um, I'm not sure if it's a question of right or wrong. It's, it's. Um, I, I suspect that it that just underlines the difficulty in, um, in identifying fossils from from limited uh, remains, and of course. Uh, if you want to take Wim Scott Lawrence take on the debate, I suspect this is what he might say. And then just to end off the talk, I thought you'd enjoy this sequence. Uh, this is in the Okavango. Don't seem to mind getting their paws wet. Yeah, I'm recording video. So I think with that, uh, um, that's about uh, about it. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was absolutely fascinating, even coming from a geologist. Are there any questions or comments? Maybe just one for me. Um, Andy, do you see this sort of stuff in fish species as well? Uh, if you've got about um, a year and you sit down with Woody Cottrell, the answer is yes, uh, Craig. We'll, we'll, um, uh, uh, geomorphology has, has a major imprint on uh, fish evolution. So if you get a, a drainage line that, that's um, dismembered, then you start getting uh, fish uh, you know, species in the different uh, 
parts of the channel speciating uh, um, separately. Uh, cancel. Uh, Mark, I see that you've unmuted yourself. Mark Berry, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, hi Andy. Recent hi, work. Hi. Recent work on the genetics of the lion population in southeast Botswana uh, at Mashatu and across the river at, at Punisha suggests that they are genetically distinct both from the Kruger population and from the Okavango population and from the Kalahari population. Wow. Um, I don't know whether you've seen any of that, that, that work that's been published recently. And um, no, no. does this perhaps suggest that some of the earlier geomorphology when in fact there's a Zambezi flowed southeastwards into the Makatsi and into the Shashi and Limpopo that may well have created a separate wetland that allowed a distinct population of lions to establish there. Yeah, I hadn't heard about that at all, Mark. I mean, that's fascinating. And uh, for the other listeners, uh, Mark's a biologist. He's, he's uh, farming on the Limpopo River and uh, uh, can probably tell us more about uh, um, evolution. Well, that than most people, let's just put it that way. Um, but that's fascinating, Mark. I, I hadn't heard that. And um, uh, who did the research? Do you, do you know? Um, I don't off the top of my head, but I'll dig it out for you. And it was presented at the, the Oppenheimer Research Conference two years ago. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll find it and I'll, and I'll let you have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the story just gets more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Do we have any other questions? Any comments? Can I ask another question? Go for it, Mark. Uh, the, the lion population in KwaZulu-Natal is introduced, uh, or reintroduced, I should say. Right. There were no lions from about late 1800s up until, I guess, about the 1960s when that population was re-established in the Omphalozi Shishlui complex. And I just wonder when you refer to those genetics of that population, which were yellow and quite different. Yeah. I imagine you could trace their, their lineage back to the, the founder population. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd wondered about that, Mark, and um, but that makes sense. And of course, it, you know, it, it, it raises the question of what do you do if you want to introduce lion populations? For, for instance, um, the lions in the southwestern Kalahari are FIV free, and so they thought to be, uh, you know, a good group to, um, to go and get to introduce into other areas. But um, you know, you 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 would have to think very carefully about where you introduced them. Yeah, absolutely. And it occurs and course, in several species. Sorry. Hyenas is a similar situation. Yeah, uh, yeah. Buffalo, brucellosis, and is a similar situation in populations. And unfortunately, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to keep these populations isolated as people move animals left, yeah. right and centre. Anyway, that, that, that clears up a puzzle. I was, I was wondering about uh, that Natal population and, and uh, um, I suspect may have been introduced but from the southwest Kalahari simply because they are FIV free. Yeah. Um, I don't remember offhand, but again, it would be well documented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments? No? Well, in that case, Andy, thank you so much. That was, um, as I said earlier, fascinating. I'd also like to 
Again, thank Tacoma Strategies who are uh, sponsoring this month's talks. And thanks all of you for joining us. Um, if there aren't any other questions or comments, I will close the meeting. Oh, Luruli, I see your hands up. And Paul, Martin, Luruli. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Yes, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, about the, the continuous professional uh, development points. On, I, I, on, because I saw on the intro, uh, um, foundation for a geologist uh, uh, webinars that uh, if we attend the, 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 the free online talks, we get those points. So I just wanted a clarity on that. Thank you. I'm not sure who can answer that uh, question. Um, um, sure, I'll answer that. So yes, uh, you do get CPD points for this and it goes under informal learning. So if you go onto the GSSA website or the SACNAS website, you can log these uh, talks. Does that help, Paul? Uh, so uh, how, how many points is, is per session? Um, I'm not exactly sure. You'd have to go and check on the websites. Okay, thank you. Right. Well, thanks very much, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting. Um, and again, thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thanks very much. And, and thanks okay. for listening. Oh, it was great. Thank you. Bye.